Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, so this will be part two. Basically part two of what it means to live a life under the philosophy of being a lean operator, basically. Um, I think lean operator is probably a much better um, metaphorical device than just saying emptiness. I think emptiness is just, it's just too lazy. It's just it's just a very vague and, and just, an, just an easy word, but I think lean operator is more specific, more concrete. And I think it's, it's, um, it's easier to see a, a kind of a, an attractiveness or a nobility to maybe those of us who are like, say, inclined to like the, the attractiveness of being like a marathon runner or something like that. Sort of the idea of being a lean operator, you know, um, in the world, it's sort of like, you know, being effective, being, being in, uh, engaged and actually effective and engaged in the world and not being loaded down with the inflation of personal gratification and just, and just, you know, personal interest and human interest, just being a, a pure operator. There, there's something kind of, I don't know, kind of romantic about that in, in a kind of a philosophical way, but okay. So in the last video, I was suggesting that, you know, just because let's say those of us who like the idea of being a lean operator, you know, it, you might say this is like another way of saying like not having a big inflated ego, basically, you know, not having a big, fat, blurry, excessive, uh, you know, um, sort of personality, like being excessively fat and blurry around, like, say, gratifications and personal interest and human human interest. OK, so the idea is being a lean operator, you know, that it's kind of an attractive idea. All right. But the, like a, like any philosophy, and this is true of any philosophy, you cannot you cannot live a philosophy by just being in agreement with it. Okay, so in other words, um, there's lots of ideas out there. Okay, and and I can be in agreement with many of them. Oh, I like that idea. You know, I subscribe to that, and oh, I want to live that way. Okay, just just agreeing with a philosophy and saying, oh yeah, I like that, um, does does not is not enough to actually be able to to do it and and even just trying to do it is not enough to actually live a philosophy okay so any of us who like the idea of being a lean operator okay well there is no way we can actually live that way okay any more than we can just get up one day after being lazy for years and just run a marathon it's impossible it's actually impossible a person who is not conditioned to run a marathon cannot run a marathon. Okay. And let's say, let's say you're conditioned to run 12 miles instead of 24 miles. Okay. If I'm conditioned to run 12 miles and I've never run more than 12 miles in my life, I could maybe, maybe I could run 24 miles, but I'm going to hurt myself. Okay. And that will not be healthy. And, and I could do a lot of damage. Okay. So, um, the bottom line is that just because we agree and we we like a philosophy and we're inspired by it and we think oh yeah this is this is me you know whatever bullshit that's bullshit we cannot actually do it okay unless we go through exactly the same process that would take a regular person to become a marathon runner okay and let's also be honest okay some people do not have the genetics to ever be a marathon runner, even if they tried, because even if they had the cardiovascular potential, they may not have enough um, resilience in the cartilage of their knee or the cartilage of their waist or the geometry of their, their hip bones, basically. And what they'll end up doing is causing a lot of damage to their hips and their knees. Okay. So even if you had the cardiovascular potential, your skeleton, your muscular skeletal, um, you know, you know, your, your ligaments and all that may not be right for running a marathon. So in other words, I think all of us should have a kind of um, a realism, a realism that we have to always distinguish between appreciating a philosophy and maybe holding it as an appreciation is like a motivation, but understanding that we may not actually be able to adapt all the way to actually being the same thing as the philosophy that, that we appreciate. So in other words, like I may romanticize myself, the idea of being a really lean operator in life. Okay. But in reality, I never know how much I can get out of myself. Okay. Because I'm limited by my metabolism, by my temperament, by my own neurology. Okay. And I believe neurology is adaptable. Okay. But it's adaptable only as far as my body can allow it. Okay, so I may have limitations in my own combination of endocrine system, hormones, um, you know, neurotransmitters, maybe even just just the 
the capacity of my own brain, you know, that I may be able to go on the path to being like, say, a lean operator. And I may love the philosophy of it. I may love it. But I have to be realistic that I may not actually achieve completely the ideal that I appreciate. So we have to be fully understanding that that philosophy is something that you cannot live completely, okay, except through the path of adapting ourselves towards the the ideal that we we think that we that we um, identify with okay so in other words when i identify and i appreciate any kind of philosophy any kind of philosophy i have to always remind myself that i am not really there even though i appreciate it i'm not i haven't really i'm not actually living that philosophy and i may never completely live that philosophy but I, all i can do if i'm interested is engage in the process of adapting myself, adapting my conditioning myself, adapting my whole metabolism, my endocrine system, um, my actual metabolism and, and my neurology, and hopefully on the path of getting close to or just approaching, but never mistaking myself for actually living that philosophy. Okay, so I think it's very important. People would say, well, have humility. You know, it's, it's like, I don't want to use the word humility, just realism, realism. Okay. Humility is a bullshit word, by the way. Who wants to be, and why would it ever be good for a person to be actually humble? I think the better word is to say realistic. Okay, realistic that, you know, knowing knowing the difference between what you appreciate and where you actually are in terms of your own conditioning. Okay, you don't have to use the word humble. It's just realism. It's just being real that, you know, I'm not where I, I'm not where I would like to be or I am not where I have my ideal, um, let's say my, I am not at the same place in terms of what I can do as to what I appreciate would be a good way to be, you know, the things that I appreciate as what would be a nice way to live life or a noble or an ideal way to live life. I am, I, I appreciate it and I agree with it. And that is, let's say the philosophy that I agree with, but realistically, who knows how close I could actually get to it, except that I can decide, and this is this is where we do have agency. You know, we have agency to even to develop, let's say, a, a philosophy outside of our default philosophy. Okay, so our default philosophy is just always being into gratification and just being very centered, like seventy to eighty percent, and just how gratified we are about, you know, just our status of gratification. Because that, so if, if we just have, like, say, a default philosophy like that, we have no agency in terms of even selecting a philosophy. So. Our first agency is even being able to select a philosophy except other than our default philosophy. OK, so that takes a certain amount of agency. OK, yeah. but then the second level is understanding yeah. that no matter what philosophy I accept or I agree with to have no joking, you know, no kidding, no kidding ourselves that I am actually living that philosophy just because I agree with it or I chose it. OK, and realistically understanding <clears throat> <clears throat> that you know, I may I may now agree with and, and believe in, let's say, the lean operator philosophy. OK, but until I get on the path of conditioning, I am still effectively living the gratification philosophy, even though I now agree with the and I and I supposedly believe in and subscribe to the the lean operator philosophy. OK, so realistically, you know, I'm here talking and talking and talking about how I think it, it would be great to be a lean operator and to have all the cameras set up to have more perspective in life to not just be, you know, engrossed in, you know, the world of, of gratification and gratification. But even though I talk about it, and I say how much I, I subscribe to and believe in being a lean operator effectively, right now, as I sit here talking to you guys, okay, I may actually be only living still the philosophy of being more in gratification, okay, because I can only move in the path towards being a lean operator only to the extent that I actually adapt my metabolism, my endocrine system, my neurology, my endurance, um, you know, my actual physical endurance, okay, and, and my actual physical constitution. To the extent that I, uh, that I, I'm on that path. I'm actually moving, like, say, away from, like, say, being just in gratification. OK, but as I stand here today, OK, I am probably much more towards the gratification philosophy. OK, so while I subscribe to and agree with and idealize this this more lean operator, as I talk to you right now, I probably am more of a gratification based. Um, in other words, that that's the philosophy I'm actually living. OK. 
because I'm, I can only live what I'm conditioned and able to do. It's just no different than a person who's not conditioned to run 12 miles or 24 miles and to do it without hurting themselves. OK, so if I were to strain and strain and strain to be a lean operator, but uh, but I'm not really conditioned for it. And if I could do it, maybe just a little bit, I'm actually causing harm to myself because I'm not actually adapted to that. OK, and I may, I may never get I'm, I'm, even though I idealize this idea of being a lean operator, even in my best development, I may still remain for the entirety of my life, you know, maybe on the path, but maybe more close to, let's say, the, the gratification. OK, but the thing is, is that, you know, in life, let's be realistic, you know, first, let's just accept it. Let's just accept it that, you know, there's a big difference between the philosophies that we agree with and the philosophies that we're actually living. OK, and just to accept it, take the bitter pill, take the medicine, feel like crap about it. You know, I while I appreciate the lean operator philosophy and, you know, being this kind of like, you know, not to have inflation and in the self and being all, you know, full of uh, gratification concerns and tied up in gratification status, I may effectively, even though I appreciate being a leaner person, I may effectively still be very, very tied up in gratification just because of my conditioning. OK, so uh, as long as we're realistic and we understand that our agency for selecting a philosophy, OK, is not the same thing as the agency of actually living it, because just living it is not just wanting to, not just trying. It is actually the decades or the years process of actually developing ourselves to be the equivalent of on the path to being a marathon runner. OK, and that means co completely changing our whole endocrine system, our whole metabolism, our whole neurology, even our, even the platform of our hormones has to kind of change. OK, and I'm going to talk about that right now. OK, so so in other words, um, just to be so realistic that just because we like an idea or we believe in something or we that's that's like say, oh, that's my philosophy. Well, it's only your philosophy in your head. But to actually live it, now you have to do the hard work of conditioning yourselves to actually live what you say you, you believe in. So most of us probably, even though we, we may choose, let's say, very lofty, very, very romantic philosophies, OK, we may actually be and probably are living the another philosophy, a, a more basic default philosophy. And so I have to come to terms, be honest, that even though I've chosen, let's say, a more noble, a more you know romantic, whatever, more more maybe a, a, a better, a better, let's say, um, you know, philosophy for, let's say, not having such an inflated, um, you know, such an inflated self, basically, you know, being so tied up just in personal gratifications. Okay. Even though I've chosen that better, like say better philosophy, and, and I may say that's my philosophy. Okay. Effectively, I'm still living the, the more default uh, egotistical, let's say narcissistic philosophy. I'm, I'm actually, that's what I'm actually living. Okay. So just to be real about that, just to accept it, you know, that I, I choose and I subscribe, uh, let's say a, a good, more noble philosophy, but I'm actually living a more basic and narcissistic philosophy because I'm limited by my conditioning. And if we're real about that and we accept that, then it's a, it's only a matter of another level of agency for us to actually get into the task of actually developing ourselves, okay, to actually be a little more the marathon runner, okay, just the lean operator, okay, and we use that lean operator as like a motivation, but never confusing ourselves that we're actually farther in the path than we actually are in terms of conditioning, okay, and not to fool ourselves. If I if I'm foolish and I I get all the way up to running 16 miles, okay. But then one day I just try to stretch it out to 24, okay, without going in steps, I could actually hurt myself and then I haven't accomplished anything. I haven't really accomplished being the lean operator marathon runner. I haven't really because what I did is I hurt my hips or my knees and I'm actually not really where I want to be. So it's sort of like you're, you're pretending to be or you're stretching yourself to be more than what you really are. OK, and so now if I want to go from like, say, 16 miles, if I get to see that's amazing. I mean, God, to get to 16 miles running, that's amazing. But I'm not to 24 yet. Right. I haven't gotten there yet. But if I want to really stretch it to maybe 16 and a half, maybe 17. OK, and then I really do that responsibly. And I, and I do that through just transforming myself so that I really can do it without hurting myself. Well, OK, well, then I stretch it to 17. You know, and then maybe over years and years, I could get it to 18, maybe 19. And then maybe maybe on my deathbed, when I'm finally dead, 
I might have gotten to 19 and a half miles. I never got to 24. But you know what? I live my life in the process of moving in the direction. And that, I think, is valid. That's a valid way of, like, say, living the philosophy, but never confusing our position in terms of conditioning with where we're actually want to, where we actually want to be, or let's say where we're motivated to be. You know what I mean? So I just think it's so important as we develop philosophies, as we choose through our agency to ascribe to, subscribe to, and let's say to agree with and to, to adopt philosophies, never to say that we're actually there. Um, in other words, to, to understand that, okay, I've chosen and adopted a philosophy, but my effective philosophy is still only where I'm conditioned, okay? And to, to never confuse those two things. So I think when, when we talk about having a philosophy, we need to understand that we have a philosophy in two ways. We have it in terms of what we subscribe to, what we idealize and what we um, sort of adopt as like say the ideal, and then our actual uh, conditioning level where we're actually at, which is our effective philosophy, okay? so. Uh, if we're going to be responsible talking about philosophies, we have always two philosophies. We have our chosen subscribed philosophy and then our effective philosophy, and they're always going to be different. Okay. And if we want to have extra agency, then we have to dedicate ourselves to at least um, the project of conditioning ourselves and make it very important. Okay. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about then what does it mean to actually be conditioned in terms of philosophy? Okay. In terms of getting a little bit outside of like say the world of personal gratification personal gratification okay well i don't i don't think it's exactly the same thing as like running and running and running to try to be a marathon runner because psychologically the equivalent or let's say the the analog to running probably has a lot to do with a little bit tolerating discomfort tolerating um and sort of enduring and enduring like say dissonances and discomforts and just non-gratifying states you know so um that's like the equivalent of running but here's the thing even that i don't think we can do okay if we have too much of a hormonal cocktail if we have too much of a hormonal cocktail of the distress mentality okay so I'm going to give you guys a really good example. Okay. I've had a lot of panic disorder in my life. All right. And for whatever reason, like say, if I meditate on really, um, if I meditate on really uh, morbid things, like what would it feel like to have a heart attack? You know, and I'm, I'm the kind of person I'm, I'm perverse enough. I've got a sick enough brain that sometimes I can get really latched into that idea of like, what would it be like to have a heart attack? And I get so like, almost like almost I like start reverberating in that, in that headspace that I actually provoke really distressing cocktail of, um, of hormone. You know, we produce hormones when we're, when we feel like we're, it's, it's a, it's a medical fact that a person who actually has the sensation or the perception that they're having like a heart attack, they produce a lot of hormones that really mess up, um, that, that really like flood you, you know, and they can really cause a lot of panic and a lot of anxiety and stuff. And so basically I'm the kind of person where for whatever reason, I, I kind of tend to like, if, if I, if I had like an electric guitar, I sort of put my guitar in front of the amplifier and I sort of reverberate that, that, and it, and it just causes this explosion of bad, I think hormones and bad endocrine, whatever. And it's just a bad place to be. And so, um, that's not the kind of discomfort I'm talking about tolerating. Cause when you get into that reverberation in, in a certain kind of distress, um, basically, um, you're not even, you don't even have the opportunity to sort of get out of your own inflation. You sort of, and, and also I'm not just talking about, um, just panic and anxiety. I'm just saying very, very personal feelings. So that's just one example, you know, the example of like, say, you know, morbid, morbid fears of dying or whatever. That's just one example. Another example could just be sexual arousal. Okay. You see what I mean? So like, for some people, it's maybe like panic, kind of, uh, you know, existential fear or whatever. For other people, it could be a sexual sexual arousal, which is actually not very far from anxiety. Actually, they're all kind of these very they're these very primal, very primal survival kind of sensations, right? Or like say jumping out of uh, an airplane to do skydiving. That's they say the adrenaline, the adrenaline, whatever. So there's this whole cluster of like very primal sort of super super stimulations, super stimulations, like say, like say around food, like, like really just eating, just really like enjoying food, but almost like gluttony, like the gluttony of the food or, 
you know, whatever. So we all have these sort of like very primal sensations, these primal, um, primal stimulations, primal stimulations. And, and they include things like deep anxiety, morbid, maybe violent uh, thoughts, you know, whatever. It's just this very primal, primal place. And I just think that um, the hormonal cocktail in that area is so powerful. All right. And it's not just mental. It's, it's hormonal. It's endocrine. It's just so much going on that that if you're habituated to being in that storm of just high adrenaline, high uh, primal stimulation, um, anxiety, panic, whatever, that that place right there is just where we get super inflated in the gratification zone. OK, and I don't think that right there is the area um, like, say, like, say, suffering, um, like, say, sexual frustration and being super stimulated and frustrated or let's say me, let's say having the panic, whatever. I don't think that's the kind of discomfort that really puts us on the marathon path. I think that's the kind of uh, storm that is actually like the opposite of running. You know what I mean? Running is when you sort of let that cool down and you're into like the real operations of life. Okay. Where you're not all tied up in this primal preoccupation or this primal stimulation. So how do I do the equivalent of running? Okay. From that primal stimulation. Okay. Well, that is a much more abstract and a much more complicated process. Okay. And so in my case, okay, I had to learn to sort of cool down all that primal. Sorry, guys. They're not my dogs. These are not my dogs. And I, I don't know what it's very frustrating. It's terrible. Anyway, so how do I get away from this primal inflation, this inflation of primal stimulation? Okay. It is very hard to do. And it's not like, oh, you muscle your way. No, 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 no. It's very difficult. Okay. The only way that I've found to do the equivalent of running and getting into operations outside of the primal stimulation, okay, where you're all inflated in gratification and all this garbage. All right. The only way I've learned how to do it, and everybody's different, I had to really make my life super boring, super boring. And I had to kind of accept it, even though everything in my fiber, everything in my fiber does not want to have a boring life. Okay. But I had to choose it mentally. I had to say that I know that intuitively I cannot, ha I cannot have all this primal stimulation going on because it's like a storm that's just inflating my gratification zone, okay? And basically making this big inflated blurry thing out of myself. And I don't have any more bandwidth and reservoir and resources to actually be outside of myself, okay? So I have to, even though I don't want to, I have to deflate all this primal gratification uh, stimulation. Got to deflate it. And the only way a person can do that is by getting into a very boring, boring, zero drama life for a long time so that you kind of just let it kind of deflate and sort of become a non-entity, all this primal, primal uh, stimulation. Okay. So in my case, I did it in several ways and I, I did it through intuition because I knew that I had to get this primal uh, gratification uh, fireworks, had to get all those fireworks to just come down. So I could have that sort of emptiness in a way to just get that baseline. So I'm not always in this charge, this charge of primal stimulation. All right. And I know for everybody, they're like, hey, I'd rather be dead than let go of my primal stimulation. Well, you know, you're not going to die. OK, you're not just try it as an experiment. It's just an experiment. You know, just live super boring, super boring where every day is the same. And you're going to find that um, you get into a, zip, a different zone. OK, like, for example, I did just an experiment. I didn't want to, but I just tried it. I just tried to have like, I'm sorry, I'm going to be honest, just like zero sexual activity, zero, zero, zero. But here's the thing. It wasn't like I was struggling, struggling. I didn't I didn't think of it as, oh, I'm not going to have any. I'm going to frustrate myself. I'm going to be frustrated. No, no. What I did was I didn't think of it as that. I'm not going to fight it. I thought of it as I'm just going to put the idea of sex just out of my mind. Just I'm just going to let it be a nothing to me. You know, and I, I know it seems hard to do, but because at first you're going to struggle at first, you're going to struggle. So you have to let yourself have a few weeks where it's sort of like a struggle, but then just get to where it's just not even in your mind, it's just not even in your mind. And it, you have to play with your head a little bit, you know, but over time, it just becomes outside of your mind. It's not in your mind. You know what I mean? It takes time. You have to go through a rough period. It's like I'm sure like people withdrawing from heroin, they go through a few months where it's just like 
feeling like crap. But then over time, you just kind of almost forget about it. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of the same thing. So like for me, it was like the panic stuff. I just told myself, I'm just going to live a boring life in pajamas and I'm just going to live, you know, just very low stress, very boring. And then I'm just not, I'm just going to slowly just, just not think about morbid and, you know, kind of like panicky kind of things. And just, I'm just going to focus on being in pajamas. I say pajamas metaphorically and just, I'm just going to live my bologna sandwich, pajama bullshit, boring, 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 boring. And the boring, boring over, over time, even the, even the morbid intensities started just kind of forgetting themselves. I just sort of started forgetting that stuff. So I lived almost, I started forgetting, forgetting all about all the sexual stuff and just all the, the nervous stuff because I just got fully into the boring stuff. And now it's not like you want to live boring as like a final destination, but it's like a, it's a transition method to sort of transition out of having all this fireworks and all this primal stimulation. Okay. So you, you get a new baseline where your new baseline is just boring emptiness, basically, okay, in terms of gratification stimulation, right? So you get into this kind of new sort of emptiness. It's not really emptiness. It's just relative emptiness because before you're so inflated in all this gratification fireworks, all right? So you get into this new place where you just kind of almost forgot what it was like to have drama, what it was like to have even sexual ideas, because you're just in a different space. You just, you got into kind of like an empty space, you know? It's just a transition, right? And now that you got into this place where now you don't have all this fireworks and all this primal, primal stimulation going on, now you have space to actually cleanly have that leanness to actually start operating in the world. So it's like a two or three step procedure where first you have the, you would say the withdrawal, where you actually are struggling, where you still feel like the demons are still attacking you, but you're trying to just kind of like not engage in like say sexual or like say nervous uh, thoughts or whatever. And at first it's kind of like, it's like a withdrawal period where it's, you're, you're, out, you're fighting and it, and it goes down slowly. But over time, as you focus on being boring, 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 okay. The, that sort of gratification stimulation stuff starts deflating and you start kind of forgetting, you start sort of forgetting about it. I say, I apologize so much for those dogs. I, I don't have time to do more takes of these videos. Anyway, so over time, you uh, you sort of get in the boring zone and you get that deflation of the, the gratification uh, stimulations, right? And then from there, now you have the sort of emptiness, you know, whatever. You, you've really, you're really just taking the fat out of your personality. It's not like you're nothing. You just took the fat out of it, you know? And now that you're in this kind of like more empty place where you're not so loaded down with all this, this primal stimulation, now you just start mechanically operating in the world and getting more invested in what's outside in the environment. In the environment, I just mean, I just mean what's around you. You know what I mean? Just like the world of other people, of things to do, of businesses or whatever. And, and you're just, you're a little leaner. And by being psychologically leaner, I think you have cleaner thoughts. And I think you have more like to the point, like you start analyzing things more to the point and you start just dealing with things more directly. Okay. And then from there, you can actually start what, what you might think is the lean operations, which is those, all those steps, like say the, the withdrawal, the, the deflation of the, of the, the primal primal stimulations and then sort of forgetting about sex and just forgetting just forgetting just it's not even in your head you just become more empty and then getting into actual operations in the world okay um all those steps okay are the equivalent of the running to be a marathon runner okay so in this in this case it's not so easy it's not like oh i just go outside and run in a way being a marathon runner actually is actually easier in the sense that you just have to run and run and run and maybe do diet and you know, whatever. But for, for this more mental um, marathon running, it's a little more of like several steps uh, where you kind of go through a kind of withdrawal period. You, you learn to achieve emptiness and then you learn to sort of almost forget about primal stimulation uh, material. And then you sort of get into then just operating as a lean entity, you know. So uh, it does require like steps and it's kind of mental. Um, but that's the equivalent of sort of learning how to um, how to be like a, a marathon runner. And in that process, I think we re we readapt and we recondition our metabolic endocrine neurological and we sort of transform. OK, but we can relapse. That's the thing. We can relapse, but we have to sort of be dedicated to that kind of more empty way. 
And I think that can be how we adapt ourselves over months and months to be the, the lean operator. So anyway, thanks for watching.